Today we're starting chapter 3, section 4, complex numbers, part 1. This is the beginning of unit 2 for us, since we're all done with unit 1. Um, so we will go over this for a few days, and then on Friday we will have a test slash quiz over complex numbers. So make sure you're paying atten attention extra carefully and getting these notes down, just in case I let you use those notes on the quiz slash test. So let's get into part one. The imaginary unit I. Not all quadratic equations have real number solutions. For example, x squared equals negative 3 has no real number solutions because the square root of any real number is never a negative number. So if we have the equation x squared equals negative 25, how we would solve that is we would take the square root of both sides of my equation. That'll cancel out that squared with the x and we'd be left with x equals. Now in Algebra 1 you learned that we can't take the square root of a negative number because no number times itself will give you a negative. Positive times a positive gives you a positive. Negative times a negative also gives you a positive. So in Algebra 1, we would have said this has no real roots. Now today, this imaginary unit i is going to help us be able to take the square root of a negative number. So to overcome this problem, mathematicians created an expanded system of numbers using the imaginary unit i defined as i equals square root of negative 1. So you need to know that i equals the square root of negative 1. You also need to know that i squared equals negative 1. The imaginary unit i can be used to write the square root of any negative number. So like I said, we are now able to take the square root of negative numbers unlike we have been able to in the past. So let's look at that. Here's our square root property or square root of a negative number property. If r is a positive real number, then the square root of negative r equals i square root of r. So they got that by starting off with the square root of negative r. We can break that down into negative 1, the square root of negative 1 times r. On the previous slide, I know that i equals the square root of negative 1. So if I take the square root of negative 1, I get i on the outside of the radical, and then I have r left under the radical. That's how they went from here to here, just like that. And so there's a little example over here. The square root of negative 3 equals i times the square root of 3. They did that the same way I just showed you here at the bottom. And then number 2, by the first property, it follows that i square root of r squared equals negative r. And I'll show you how, you, how they got there. So they have i square root of r squared that would give me i squared times r. On the previous slide, we see that i squared equals negative 1. So that's negative 1 times r, which equals negative r. So hopefully you can see that relation. And like I said, it's important to know that i equals square root of negative 1 and that i squared equals negative 1. So, let's look at some examples of simplifying expressions. Letter A, I have the square root of negative 25. So, like on the previous slide, I can break this down into negative 1 times 25. We know the square root of negative 1 is I. And the square root of... The square root of 25 is 5, so that gives us 5i. If 
for our simplified expression. Now let's look at letter B. We have the square root of negative 72. So once again, I can break this down into negative 1 times. Now I want to find the biggest perfect square that goes into 72. If you remember from Algebra 1, that's how I simplify square roots. I'm looking for the biggest perfect square that goes into my radicand. In this case, it is 36. I know that 36 times 2 gives me 72. So I can take the square root of negative 1, which gives me i. I can take the square root of 36, which gives me 6. I cannot take the square root of 2, so 2 just stays under the radical. So my simplified version of the square root of negative 72 is 6i square root of 2. Hopefully you remember that from Algebra 1. If not, you might need to brush up on it a little bit because that's what we're doing. We're simplifying square roots. We just throw the negative in there, and that gives us our imaginary unit i. So looking at letter C, I have negative 5 times the square root of 9. This is like negative 5 times the square root of negative 1 times 9. So my negative 5 doesn't really change anything. I just have to bring it down and multiply it by whatever I bring outside of the radical. So the square root of negative 1 is i. And I know the square root of 9 is 3. So I've taken the square root of everything under the radical, so my radical is now gone. It has gone away. Now I do negative 5 times 3 gives me negative 15 i for my simplified version of negative 5 times the square root of negative 9. Let's move on. Let's look at evaluating a power of i. So if you remember from my first slide, we said that i squared equals negative 1. So if I continue that, if I look at i cubed, i to the third power, I can break that down into i squared times i. If I add the exponents of those i's, 2 plus 1 gives me 3, so I, can, I know I can break down i cubed into i squared times i. Well, i squared equals negative 1, so that's just negative 1 times i, which is negative 1. So I know i cubed equals negative i. Now let's look at i to the fourth power. I can break i to the fourth power down into i cubed times i. We know i cubed equals negative i. So that'd be negative i times i, which would give me negative i squared. That'd be like me saying negative, negative 1, which gives me positive 1. So I know i to the fourth equals positive 1. So looking at this chart right here, we see a pattern. i to the 0 is 1, i to the first power is i, i squared is negative 1, i cubed is negative i. And then when we get to i to the fourth, the pattern starts over going 1, i, negative 1, negative i. So it's repeating every four terms. So because i to the fourth equals one, the value of i to the n power is determined by the remainder of my exponent divided by four, n divided by four. So let's look at this core concept down here. If I need to evaluate a power of i, to evaluate a power of i, divide the exponent by four. If your remainder is zero, power equals i to the 0 power or 1. When the remainder is 1, the power equals i to the first, which equals i. Remainder is 2, power equals i squared, which equals negative 1. 
And when the remainder is 3, the power equals i to the third, which equals negative i. So this is really beneficial, especially if I give you i to like the 2070th power. I wouldn't want to continue this chart all the way to the 2070th exponent. I can use this little core concept to figure that out. So let's look at this example. Evaluate i to the 27th. So based on this slide, I need to divide my exponent by 4. So I'm doing 27 divided by 4. Hopefully you guys remember your long division skills from way back when. 4 goes into 27 6 times. 4 times 6 is 24. Subtracting those, I get 3. So my answer when I divide 27 divided by 4 is 6 remainder 3. Since my remainder is 3, I know that i to the 27th equals i to the 3rd, which equals negative i. Down here, we said that when the remainder is 3, the power equals i to the 3rd, which equals negative i. So that's what you do. Take your exponent, divide it by 4. Whatever your remainder is, that's your new exponent for i, which you can then evaluate. So it may seem kind of difficult, but it's actually pretty easy, especially the more you practice. So now let's look at standard form of a complex number. A complex number written in standard form is a number a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers. The number a is the real part of the number, and the number bi is the imaginary part. So this is standard form right here, a plus bi. If b does not equal 0, so b is any, other, any number other than 0, then a plus bi is an imaginary number. If my real part, a equals 0, and b does not equal 0, then a plus bi is a pure imaginary number. So that's just an imaginary part, but no real part. The diagram to the right shows how different types of complex numbers are related. So in the green section, we have our real numbers. That's when I don't have an imaginary part. It's 0i. So all I have is the real part of a. So that's negative 1, 5 thirds, pi, and square root of 2. Those are all just examples. In the blue, we have the imaginary numbers. That's where b does not equal 0. And it's in the form a plus bi. So 2 plus 3i is an imaginary number. 9 minus 5i. Those are just a couple examples. For it to be pure imaginary numbers, I don't have a real part. My real part is 0. So 0 plus bi. And b does not equal 0. So that's just any number that has just an imaginary part. Negative 4i, 6i, those are just examples. So we're talking about standard form. We want to make sure anytime we have a complex number, we write it in standard form. Sums and differences of complex numbers are really, really easy. To add or subtract two complex numbers, add or subtract their real parts and their imaginary parts separately. So the sum of complex numbers, a is my real part and c is my real part, so I add them. bi is my imaginary part and di is my imaginary part, so I add them. So you're just taking the real parts, adding them, taking the imaginary parts, adding them, or subtracting. Same thing down here. A minus C, BI minus DI. So since that's pretty easy, let's jump into some examples. Looking at letter A, 8 and 5 are my real parts, so I'm adding them. 8 plus 5 gives me 13. Negative i and 4i are my imaginary parts. So I'm doing negative 1i plus 4i, 
which gives me the positive 3i. I then want to see if my answer is in standard form. It is because my real part is coming first and my imaginary part is coming second. So there's my answer for letter A. Took the real part, added it. Took the imaginary part, added it. Now let's look at letter B. Remember, anytime we have this negative, we distribute it through our parentheses. So I get 7 minus 6i minus 3 plus 6i. So adding my imagine or my real parts or subtracting them. I get 7 minus 3, which is 4. And then when I try to add or subtract my imaginary numbers, they actually cancel each other out. So that would be 0i. So I would accept it as 4 plus 0i, or I would accept it as just 4. Either one will work. I hope this is making sense to y'all. I feel like this is one of the easiest things to do with complex numbers, is add and subtract. Now let's look at letter C. Once again, I have a negative outside of a parentheses, so I need to distribute it. So I get 13 minus 2 minus 7i plus 5i. Taking my real parts, 13 and negative 2, and adding or subtracting them, 13 minus 2 gives me 11. Then I'm taking my imaginary parts and adding or subtracting them. So negative 7i plus 5i gives me negative 2i. And now I need to see if it's in standard form. It is because my real part comes first and my imaginary part comes second. So there's my answer for letter C. Now let's look at something that is also pretty easy, multiplying complex numbers. So it says multiply, write the answer in standard form. So you probably guess what we need to do on letter A. I need to distribute my 4i through my set of parentheses. So 4i times negative 6 gives me negative 24i. 4i times i gives me 4i squared. <clears throat> now remember i squared equals negative 1. So I can still take this a step further. I can replace i squared with negative 1. So I'd get negative 24i minus 4. And now I'm done with all my multiplication and everything. Now I need to write my answer in standard form. So I do need to flip it. I need to keep the negative with the 4 and put it first. I need to keep my negative with my 24i and write it second. Now that is in standard form for a complex number. So the answer for letter A is negative 4 minus 24i. And now let's look at letter B. Letter B, um, we need to use the method called FOIL. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully you guys all remember that from Algebra 1. So when we multiply a binomial times a binomial, we use FOIL. F stands for first, so I'm multiplying the first terms together. So 9 times negative 4, which gives me negative 36. O stands for outer, multiplying the outer terms together. 9 times 7i, which gives me 63i. i stands for inner, so negative 2i times negative 4, which gives me 8i. And then l stands for last, which is negative 2i times 7i, which gives me negative 14i squared. Now I'm going to combine my two imaginary parts here, and I get 71i, 
and then I'm also going to plug in negative 1 for i squared. Always, always remember that i squared equals negative 1. So that gives me negative 36 plus 71i plus 14. And now I can combine my two real parts. Negative 36 plus 14 gives me negative 22 plus 71i. So there's my answer for letter B. Um, hopefully that makes sense. I feel like multiplying is the next easiest thing besides addition and subtraction for complex numbers. If you have any questions about any of this, please feel free to email me or ask me in class. So here's our homework assignment, pages 131 through 132, number 6 through 50 evens. This is due on Canvas, and I'll talk to you all later.